Thanks very much. So why are we discussing Leninism? Why is one of the main meetings at Marxism this year devoted to this, this, this subject? Now, I wrote an article at the end of January this year called Is, is Leninism Finished? And uh, it provoked a bit of criticism. And um, one of the criticisms was that uh, in writing about Leninism, I was evading um, what was really uh, at, at stake in the debates that have been taking place inside the Socialist Workers' Party. Um, I think this is a mistake. Um, there are all sorts of issues that were in the course, course of debating, uh, some quite painful. But um, one of the things that happened after our conference in, in January was a flood of attacks on the, on the SWP, one of the most important of which was by the um, left-wing Labour columnist o Owen Jones, a very influential figure on the left, in which he explicitly argued that Leninist organisations such as the SWP were finished. So I think it was quite reasonable to say, well, shall we explore that, that particular question? In any case, I think that the, that debate, Owens's intervention and my response, and all the other responses that have taken place uh, si since, since then, are part of a much larger uh, debate that is going on internationally about how the left should organise. Because what, what we're seeing, it's quite a significant development, is a revival of left reformism. And it takes a number of different forms. The most spectacular form is the rise of Syriza, the coalition of the radical left in, in Greece. In this country, it takes two forms, um, two main forms. One is the uh, attempt to um, revive the Labour left, uh, represented most visibly by Owen Jones, but behind him, the muscle of the Unite Union, and this has become clear very spectacularly in the clash between Len McCluskey, the union, union's leader, and Ed Miliband uh, over um, Unite's and more generally the union's relationship to the, to the Labour Party. But there's another version um, that is outside the Labourist camp and which seeks to develop an alternative to Labourism, which is represented by the Left Unity Project, um, initiated around a call by Ken Loach. Now, when I say that's a version of left reformism, um, some people may say, say that's unfair and so on and so forth. But if you look at, the, uh, at Loach's statement, um, it's very much um, based, it's focused on his recent film, The Spirit of 1945, which is essentially a celebration of the 1945 Labour government, and the agenda of left unity is very much about defending the heritage of the 1945 Labour government. So it seems to me it's not a misrepresentation to say this is another version of left reformism outside Labour, very significant development, but still a version of, version of left, left reformism. So it seems to me in this, in this context, the question of Leninism as an alternative to different versions of um, left reformism is a real one. Having said that, there are learned scholars and historians in this, in this room, uh, uh, and I, I need to be very careful uh, about the, the, the category of Leninism itself, because it's a category with a problematic history. It was constructed immediately after the death of Lenin by the so-called triumvirs, the alliance of Zinoviev, um, Stalin and Kamenev, which sought to um, take control of the Bolshevik party after Lenin's death, and they developed an orthodoxy um, around... Um, around Lenin, involving a cult of him, renaming uh, St. Petersburg, sorry, Petrograd, Leningrad, all sorts of things like that, to construct an orthodoxy that would both legitimize them and, very important, exclude Trotsky. So it's, it's a category that one should be, to a degree, suspicious of. And one of the great things about Tony Cliff's um, four-volume study of, of Lenin, uh, published in the 19, 1970s, is the way in which um, he de deconstructs 
Leninism and more specifically dismantles a whole series of Stalinist myths about Lenin, the continuity of his thoughts, the coherence of his thoughts, his brilliance, the way in which he always got things right, and so on and so forth. However, in, um, in challenging the myths about Lenin and Leninism, I think it's a mistake which Ian Birchall, in his reply to me in Socialist Review, goes some way t- towards to say that once you pick at Leninism, there's lo- nothing left. There's a play by Ibsen called Pierre Gint, and there's a famous scene in it in which um, there's a discussion about a man's soul which is compared to an onion. And if you unravel an onion, what do you find at the end? You find nothing. The soul has disappeared. Now, that's not true, I think, in the case of of Leninism understood in a certain, a certain way. There is a call to Lenin's contribution to Marxism that it's necessary to defend and to continue. Now, that you, in trying to identify that call, we can talk about the degree of coherence of Lenin's thought and how it evolves over, over time. Um, there's, a, there's a study of his thought uh, written by someone who's name I've forgotten for the minute, but it, I hope it will come, b- come back to me, Lenin's, uh, Lenin's political thought by, I can't remember who, Hardy. Neil Hardy. Thank you very much. You see, uh, this shows how socialism is a collective project. Um, <laughs> the, the knowledge of the audience makes up for the senility of the speaker. Um, and uh, he, he distinguishies a pre-1914 Lenin Uh, who understands himself as a sort of consistent and loyal orthodox second international Marxist, and a Lenin after 1914 who confronted with the collapse of the second international into chauvinism and reformism and so on, is forced to start rethinking what's at the core of revolutionary Marxism, reading Hegel, uh, writing the, the, what becomes the book on imperialism or doing the study for the book on imperialism, all sorts of things like that. That's all... And that's all very important, and there's much to be said about that. There's interesting scholarship about the development of Lenin as a, as a political thinker and an actor. But I would insist that one thing that gives Lenin his thought um, a, a degree of coherence, one of the things that makes it distinctive is his insistence on the question of the party. And Georg Lukács, in what he wrote about Lenin, in the early 1920s, puts it very well. He says Lenin was the first Marxist thinker to identify the question of organization as a theoretical problem. In other words, if you read Marx and Engels, of course they're activists who are interested in building different kinds of organization, and they do various things in the course of their political careers. But there's no systematic attempt to theorize what revolutionary socialist organization should be, should, should be like. Lenin is the key thinker who poses that question, the question of organization, and tries to solve it. Okay, so what's at the core of the, the problem? The core of the problem that Lenin seeks to address, or which he sees the question of the party as a, as a solution to, is that um, workers' struggles don't, through some sort of natural logic develop into, uh, produce, um, workers' struggles don't, through a natural logic, uh, cause workers' consciousness to develop in a coherent revolutionary direction. Marx and Engels thought that essentially um, such a development would take place. If you had big and strong enough movements, over time there would be a kind of natural evolution in the direction of, of revolutionary consciousness. But in fact... That, that isn't the case. That doesn't happen. And um, we can discuss the reasons for that. I don't have time to go into it in great depth. Partly it's to do with the role of bourgeois ideology. In other words, the way in which the ideas of the ruling class tend through all sorts of different institutions to dominate society and to pervade workers' consciousness. It's to do with the the very structure of capitalism, the way in which our lives are permeated by market relationships, uh, tend to fragment workers' consciousness. This is uh, what Marx is talking about when he uh, discusses commodity fetishism. And it's also, very importantly, to do with the role of reformism, which 
um, emerges out of work, workers' struggles and workers' movements, but reacts back on those move, movements to hold them back, to stop them moving beyond the limits of purely economic struggles for, for reforms. And the, the, the gap between workers' capacity to develop act, absolutely massive movements of struggle that pose the question of, uh, of power and the existence of the necessary consciousness and organisation to solve the question of power by overthrowing the capitalist state is an absolutely fundamental one. Look at Egypt today. Incredible. You know, just had a meeting about e Egypt and Syria. You know, this amazing, uh, these amazing demonstrations, 14 million people on the streets. They force Morsi from power, just as actually smaller demonstrations forced Mubarak from power whenever it was, nearly two, two and a half years ago. Who fills the vacuum that is, is produced by Morsi's, Morsi's fall? The military. That's an, an, a symptom, not simply of the weakness and fragmentation politically of the Egyptian bourgeoisie, but also of the, 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 the fact that this fantastic movement hasn't produced the kind of political consciousness and political leadership, political organization that is required to solve its problems. And the problem is reinforced by the fact that the, the um, dominant forms of party in the workers' movement don't address the problem. Um, this is obvious in the case of the reformist parties. They are part of the problem. Shall I just say Ed Miliband to illustrate the point? But the popular alternative to social democracy on the left today, the so-called broad parties of the radical left like Syriza or Die Linke in Germany or, the, very, uh, or um, the, um, the, the, the left bloc in, in Portugal and, and so on, don't either. Um, if we look at the parties of the radical left in Europe confronted with the most serious crisis of capitalism um, for for more than 50 years, most acute in Europe, most exposing the bankruptcy of the system actually, actually in, in Europe. You, and if you look at how those parties have responded, I don't have time to go into it, in different ways they fumbled the question of a political alternative to, to, the, to the crisis. Why, why is, is that? Because all these different parties either evade the question of reform and revolution, um, there's a lot of fashionable chatter that the question of reform and re revolution is, you know, an old-fashioned question. You know, we need to transcend it. Um, it's, e it's easy enough to transcend things in words. The capitalist state doesn't go away. The concentration of capitalist power in the state, which is at the heart of the question of reform or revolution, that doesn't go away just because some intellectual, you know, proves to his or her own satisfaction that reform or revolution is an old-fashioned question. So either these different parties and the people who tried to justify them ideologically fudge the question of reform or revolution, or they give the wrong answer, which is true, let's say, of the, you know, the dominant forces inside Die Linke in Germany. You know, they're quite open. We are reformists. You know, we think the problem with the old Social Democratic Party is that it's a bad reformist party. We want to be a better reformist party than them. And that leads to inadequate um, response to the crisis. And this is re reinforced by something else. Lots of people talk about the movements um, as, uh, uh, well, the movements are initially presented as, among other things, a solution to the failure of social democracy. Um, so, you know, we've had wave after wave of radicalization, starting with Seattle, Genoa, um, the initial phase of the anti-capitalist movement, the anti-war movement, more recently inspired by the Arab revolutions, Occupy, the 15th of May movement in, this, in, this, in the Spanish state, these extraordinary explosions that came apparently out of nowhere in Turkey, Turkey and Brazil. We have all these movements. And people think, people say, well, the movements are an alternative to all this old-fashioned failed reformism and... Uh, trade unions and also the, the Marxist left. All this has failed. The movement can solve, uh, sol solve our problems. But in fact, the movements don't, don't solve anything. They're very, very important developments, but movements run up against the question, question of power. Take the case of uh, Taxim Square. Fantastic. 
and Gezi Park, the, the struggle in Istanbul. Fantastic, the occupation of the square. But what happened in the end? Erdogan sent in the rat police and he cleared the square. That's not the end of the story, but that indicates the problem of the capitalist state. And simply wave after wave of movement doesn't solve that problem. Because until you get the development, in whatever form it'll take, of sufficiently democratically organized and coordinated working class power that directs itself against that state, you can't, you can't, you can't beat it. So movement isn't, isn't an alternative. The movement isn't an alternative. And what's interesting in the present situation is more and more you have a tendency for people to say the movements can re re revive reformism. So if you read Owen Jones, he doesn't just say, you know, Labour is great or Labour would be great if it moved left and we need to press to change the party and so on. He says that we need a new movement against austerity represented by the People's Assembly, crucial to whose function will be to revive Labour and make it a real, a real fighting party. So movementism and reformism feed into each other. And there are lots of ways in which we can see that at the present time. And that's something I want to come back to towards the, uh, towards the, very, the very end. At the core of Leninism is the necessity for revolutionaries, in other words, people who understand that workers and the oppressed are going to have to smash the capitalist state to change society fundamentally and solve their problems. The necessity of revolutionaries to organize, to win the majority for the struggle for power. So revolutionary organization isn't an end in itself. It's um, an effort to solve this problem of the fact that struggle doesn't automatically generate the um, consciousness and organization necessary to solve the, the, qu the question, of, question of power. Now, one thing I'll just say additionally is that Lenin's approach is distinctive uh, not simply because he talks about organization, but, but because of the way in which he un understands politics um, as the fusion point of all the contradictions of, um, of capitalist society. Um, and I tried to express this recently by talking about the primacy of politics, all, all the different uh, aspects of capitalist society and the struggle against it ultimately come into focus around the question of, of politics and of state power. I didn't coin the phrase, pr the primacy of politics, by the way. I think it was some 19th century German historian. But um, I'm amused by the fact that uh, lots of people who, including a number who think I'm the devil incarnate, um, have, have picked up the phrase, um, property is theft. Um, and the primacy, <laughs> the primacy of politics, the primacy of politics... Um, it's all right, I pinched it first. Um, the primacy of politics requires a, an organization that focuses on the question of power and seeks to bring that focus to every particular struggle or movement that, that takes place. Now, this is complicated because Marx insisted that socialism is the self-emancipation of the, of the working class. In other words, you, workers can only change society by liberating themselves. No one can do it for them. And therefore, we in the tradition of um, Lenin and the Bolsheviks, of Trotsky and so on and so forth, and of, above all of Marx himself, reject what Trotsky called substitutionism. In other words, the party substituting itself for real movements, movements and struggles. And that means that a revolutionary organization in raising the question of power and seeking to connect the different st struggles and bring out their inner logic uh, directed towards the overthrow of capitalism have to work constantly involved in, in every differ different struggle that, that takes place. Gramsci put it better than anyone, the great Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci. What we have to achieve is a dialectical interaction between the... Um, the movement from below of the masses and the organizing will of the center. And just, I just want to emphasize that phrase, the organizing will of the center. Not, not something that people are often comfortable with, but it's a necessary part of Leninism as a political project. Now, um, the SWP in the past few years, ha, uh, past, sorry, past few decades, uh, has evolved a particular version of this general approach. 
You know, in other words, um, there isn't a single way of being a Leninist. If you were a revolutionary in Egypt in the 1990s, in conditions of severe depression, uh, well, possibly depression, but certainly repression, if you were a revolutionary in South Africa at the height of the explosions in the townships and the development of the independent trade unions in the mid-1980s, you would organize in very different ways from the way in which uh, revolutionaries can organize in a, a relatively stable bourgeois democracy in an advanced capitalist country like, like Britain. They're different ways within the, the broad framework of, of Leninism, of, org uh, of achieving Leninist organization. Nevertheless, through a process of trial and error, we in the SWP have evolved a particular, um, a, a particular model of revolutionary organization that reflects our attempt to apply this broad Leninist approach to the circumstances that we found ourselves. And this has involved, um, uh, um, uh, in particular, our own model of democratic centralism, which is a democratic centralism, a very broad sense of, of organizing principles um, that emphasize both the importance of debate within a socialist, socialist organization, but also emphasizes the necessity of that debate concluding in majority decisions uh, that are binding on all members of the organization and are imp implemented collectively. But within that Within democratic centralism, there are two things um, that we've tended to emphasize. First of all, the importance of concentrated political debates, concentrated both in time, particularly in the period around our annual conference, but concentrated also in terms of political focus, concentrated political uh, debate that is designed to clarify our analysis of the situation and identify our key tasks. And those debates involve it's crucial to those debates that they involve a critical reflection on our practice um, to identify not just successes. Everyone always talks up successes. Well, actually not always. Uh, but normally everyone talks up successes but also identifies the failures in order to try and, and correct them and not operate more, 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 more effectively. So that's one key element in our version of democratic centralism. The second is... Um, that a particularly important leadership role is um, assigned to the, the Central Committee of the SWP, which is elected by the annual conference and directly accountable to the annual conference. This is quite different from what happens in many other organizations where you have a, quite a broad leadership body um, that's elected and then some sort of ex executive is constituted from within that broad body. We... we um, have thought, and I think we're still right to do that, that it's necessary to have a leadership that, is, that has quite a lot of power concentrated in its hands to make decisions and take initiatives, but is directly accountable for those initiatives to the, to the uh, elected representatives of the membership at a, an, an annual conference. We've wanted a, a leadership with the strength and authority to take initiatives that can be held to account by the annual conferences. Now, I'll let you into a secret. We haven't always perfectly operated this model. Um, and this has led to quite a lot of discussion about how we should improve that model, uh, which just in the last, uh, particularly in the last year or so, because of the, the debates that have developed inside the, the SWP, have become... Uh, have involved a climate in which some people think that the model is absolutely awful and should just be dumped, and some people argue a less extreme position that it um, should be modified in various ways. Now, the various ways in which um, those changes are justified, um, you know, and they're better and or worse reasons that are, that, that are put, and uh, it's an important discussion to have um, because it's, it's a mistake to be complacent about our practices. Um, ruthless self-criticism was one of Marx's slogans, so we have to be prepared to be ruthlessly self-critical. Self Sometimes the arguments are justified by caricature, though. You know, um, Lenin, one of the great things about Lenin, which Cliff brings out very well, is that his thought is tremendously situational. You know, in other words, he focuses 
on a specific problem and concentrates all his intellectual efforts and his political uh, energy in cracking that, that, that problem. <coughs> and his thought is bent towards, and what he writes and says is bent towards resolving that, that problem. And you can find the most flagrant contradictions between what he says at one point and what he says at another. And so there's, I think, sometimes quite disingenuous quoting of stuff that Lenin writes when he's in a united organisation with the Mensheviks and he's emphasising the importance of the autonomy of local organisation and maximum decentralisation and limiting the authority of the leadership and so on and so forth. And people quote him saying this kind of thing as if, you know, that's what Lenin believed forever uh, you know, that was, his, that was his eternal view of revolutionary organisation, which is nonsense. He was in a common organisation with the Mensheviks. They were in a stronger position than him, and he wanted to maintain the maximum room for manoeuvre. Does, doesn't mean that Lenin was a cynical opportunist. There's always the connecting thread of uh, absolutely obsessive uh, preoccupation with achieving socialist revolution, organising the working class, and so on, so on and so forth. <coughs> But his, his thought and his emphases and what he argues for shifts over time. It would be as absurd to set in stone the kind of things he writes in this context as it would be, say, the decision of the 10th Congress of the Bolshevik Party um, in 1921 to ban factions within the, within the Bolshevik Party. If we're going to draw on great thinkers, we have to study their thought quite seriously. Anyway, let's have this debate about Leninism and how to improve, how we work as revolutionaries and all, all that sort of thing. But I think it's very important to understand what we've achieved and to avoid jeopardising it. Because, you see, it's very easy to be a sect and it's very easy to adapt. Very easy to be a sect, you know, we have this holy programme, everyone else in the world are idiots, they don't agree with our programme, to hell with them. We know, we know it all. You know, that's, that's an easy position. It's very easy also to follow the big battalions, to go with the trade union leaders, to go with the, the main currents of reformism, to go with the, the trends of intellectual fashion. That's easy to do, to do as well. It's quite hard to do... What, what we have managed to achieve. Not always, you know, with all sorts of mistakes and so on along the way. <coughs> what have we achieved in the Socialist Workers' Party? We haven't, unfortunately, overthrown capitalism or led a revolution or anything like that. We have to leave that to the Egyptian comrades, at least in, in the short term. And when they've achieved it, we can go and learn at their feet. Um, but what we have built is a principled but non-sectarian revolutionary party that exists in constant ten tension with the, re with the reformists, in other words, with the trade union bureaucracy and with the, the main political forces of reformism, in particular in the Labour Party. Existing in tension with these forces is different from either what a sect would do or what people who would adapt do. If you're a sect, all right, you, ref uh, you denounce the betrayals of the reformists, but it doesn't mean anything because you, there's no interaction between you and the reformists. If you're, in, uh, if you're active in particular unions, challenging the leadership, trying to push the leadership leftwards, trying to encourage rank-and-file organisation, you're constantly interacting with the reformists, sometimes allying with them, sometimes in conflict with them. There's a relationship. But you can also um, adapt, you know, in the name of the movement with capital M and essentially, behind very radical language, end up tra uh, tailing uh, the, the reformist bureaucracy. And I want to get personal at this point and mention someone who often spoke at this platform and made really great revolutionary speeches, uh, namely John Rees, um, who is one of the main organisers of the People's Assembly, someone who's been a very good defender of the Marxist tradition over the years. At the People's Assembly, he made an astonishing speech. He said, um, people who press for strikes and think that strikes are more important than other, other kinds of protests are uh, ridiculous. All kinds of protests, civil disobedience, demonstrations, strikes, they're all each as good as each, each other. Now, that's really a, 
a profound... What, the, what that is is a sign of a profound political and intellectual degeneration because in the Marxist tradition, of course, strikes are more important than anything else. Not because we're syndicalists and just think that trade unions are wonderful and that sort of thing, but because strikes are where workers express their collective power. The problem that we have now is not that we have strikes, but that we don't have anything like enough, enough strikes. But also in that context, what was the context of the People's Assembly? This was an assembly that was sponsored by, crucially by United Len, Len McCluskey, who is under pressure, was very visible at the People's Assembly itself. Yeah, yeah, I, with luck I'll finished before then. Um, who's under a lot of, lot of pressure. Well, one can always hope. Um, um, who's under a lot of pressure to, um, to put his money where his mouth is. Perhaps that's not the wrong metaphor. That's the wrong metaphor at the minute, since Len's money is under quite a lot of discussion. But to stop talking, to stop talking about strikes and actually or organise them. To get up in that context and say, don't be ridiculous, strikes are as important as, uh, you know, civil disobedience is as good as a strike and so on, is essentially to cover for Len McCluskey. Now, John will justify that on the basis of, you know, elaborate analysis of the movement and all that, all that sort of thing, but he is acting as a cover for left, left reformism. And I think that comrades who, who think, well, you know, maybe the SWP is a waste of time, you know, we don't like what the leadership have done, they're bastards, you know, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff, they should reflect a bit on what the alternatives are. Because political space isn't, isn't infinite. And I think the alternatives to sustaining the SWP, if you want to be on the left, is either some form of sectarian var variant, you know, join the alphabet bet soup of the small far-left sects, um, you know, which is presumably some people enjoy being part of that, or um, in the name of the movement to end up adapting to the forces of left, left reformism. Those are the alternatives to trying to sustain the kind of project that we have been building over the, 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 the past, past few decades. So I think that when we discuss Leninism and when we critically re-examine, as we should, our own practice and our failures and also, I hope, our achievements, we have to understand that the stakes uh, are very high and in the, having these debates, we shouldn't jeopardize what we've achieved because it actually is something quite, quite precious. And I mean that, I mean that very, very strongly. I actually want to start by, again, referring to Owen Jones' article. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. And uh, one thing that Owen Jones did say is that the SWP punches above his weight. That's one thing he said. And I just want to focus on why we punch above our weight. We, po we punch above our weight because we're not a debating society and we're not a talking shop. We have our debate in the pre-conference period and when we've finished, everyone gets on with it. What? That's what we do. That's what we've done for a long time now. The second thing I briefly want to focus on, I don't, Alex uh, didn't, and I'm not criticising him, but Alex didn't, um, Alex didn't touch on this a lot, but uh, just the idea of uh, permanent factions within uh, the Leninism movement and why. Now, the fact is, we, the reason we don't have permanent factions is because they actually end up stifling debate and because after a while, the faction becomes more important than the actual argument itself. And you have people compromising themselves because they're more concerned about the faction. Now, if you don't agree with that and you think we should have permanent factions then it's probably not a good idea to pursue a course of action that proves us right. <laughs> That's it, thanks. I want to start from where Alex finished off, which is the lessons for us in the SWP today. So I think we have to be honest, that this, one of the central points of Lenin's politics, as Lucas expressed, was the actuality of revolution, what um, Alex has referred to as the centrality of politics, and how an organisation puts those politics into practice. I think we have to be clear that the reason that we face this debate in the SWP at the moment, is our failure to put our politics on the question of oppression into practice in the most serious way possible. And, and the crisis we're having in the organisation 
has exposed some of the flaws in our con- of how we've practiced our conception of democratic centralism. And I think we need to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we also have to ask some quite serious questions. Lenin was flexible about how he applied his, his model of politics in different periods. And I think we have to be clear that the whole section of Ali's has failed a clear test on the question of oppression, and the response to the crisis since has exposed a broader crisis of leadership. And it's fine to talk about the need for a strong and central leadership, but that's, that strong and central leadership has to be earned in practice through the application of politics in real struggles, both inside the organisation and outside in the real world. And I think we have to be clear, we don't have a cliff, we don't have a Harman, we don't have a Halas at the moment. And what we need to recognise is the first test for our organisation is going to be resolving the question of oppression, trying to clear our name and dealing, for just, dealing with justice for the, the crisis that's engulfed us. But the second question needs to be looking seriously about the state of our organisation, our relationship to the outside world, the role of revolutionaries today, and actually starting to emphasise the democratic element of democratic centralism. Because if we're going to get through this crisis, it means starting a serious period of debate from this Marxism about how we get through this together. It means recognising... It means recognising that... The solution to this crisis isn't diktats, it isn't a a strong drive from the centre. It's an attempt to construct a broader leadership which can draw together the experiences across the organisation, have a humility with people, the radicals outside our ranks, people that have left the party over this crisis, and attempt to prove in practice that we're capable of drawing together the broadest sections of revolutionaries in an organisation that can take us from being an organisation of several thousand into being the sort of mass communist party that we need. I think there's a real problem with an attempt to, what Alex's document represented, which is an attempt in a defensive way to narrow our concept of democratic centralism, to narrow down what it means to be a member of the SWP. And actually, I think that the current period requires an opening up of our organisation. It requires an attempt to put into practice the idea that all members are leaders, to shift the culture of our organisation into being one that empowers individual members to look at the world around us. And I think I make no apologies for standing up and trying to fight for the organisation that I think is necessary. I think to not do that, and for comrades in this room that hold their doubts about the case that was heard at the last conference, about what happened at special conference, I want you to ask yourself, why is it that hundreds of members have That's lost their this organisation? Why is it that several hundred more have their membership holds by a thread? And ask yourself what you can do to turn this situation around and start to build the party that we all need to see. Alex talked about how Lenin's conception was rooted in an understanding of the uneven consciousness of the working class and how there was no automatic generalisation by the bulk of the working class towards an understanding of the need for the working class to take power. And that idea that therefore that minority who do understand that need they need to organise is a core principle of Leninism. But I think Alec was also right to stress that understanding that is only the starting point and that there are always two dangers. There's a danger on the one hand of adaptation towards the rest of the movement, the rest of the class, and there's also a danger of sectarianism, only seeing the side of the need to organise and separate off. And the difficult art for revolutionaries is organising a party separate from the rest of the working class, but in order to then engage, influence and intervene and shape the working class. It's getting that right is the hard thing, and it's not easy, and it takes a lot of skill, and that does involve debate and discussion. Simply having a party is no guarantee that we have a monopoly of the truth. It does mean internal debate. Anyone who's at this Marxism who thinks the SWP is not a place for vibrant, lively, comradely internal debate hasn't been at the same event I've been. So, Rob, (laughs) welcome to the real world. We're having debates, we're having discussion. Nobody is saying if you don't agree, you've got to go out or anything like that. Let's continue that process. Let's clarify our ideas. But some things do matter. Rob referred to a case, which I'm not going into any details. There's been a lot of debate in the SWP. Processes are underway to deal with that. We're having a review of our process. That's been conducted in a serious and democratic way, and we are acting on on, on that. That's important. But, come on, there is something else that matters about our tradition. I'm all for debate. I'm not for closing down debate. Never. I think it's extremely important to continue But there is an important thing which Rob didn't mention, which is unity in action. So, for example... Me and Rob both happen to be in the party's teachers' fraction. 
I'll continue arguing with Rob. There's lots of things I absolutely disagree with Rob on, but I want us to be acting together to build the strikes in teacher strikes coming up in the autumn, to build the 29th a demonstration in Manchester. If and when in London the EDL march, I want us to be acting in unity to implement the agreed position of the party to mobilise against that. All the discussion and debate is necessary, but it's about then taking decisions, and this is where the centralist part of democratic centralism does matter, about what we do together in practice to intervene in the real world. I mean, we need the democracy, but we need that turning the democratic discussion into unified practice. Otherwise, we do become a talking shop. We do become something divorced from the rest of the class. So, yes, let's have the debate. We are doing that. Let's continue those debates, but let's also understand we are a party which seeks to shape and intervene in the real struggle, and that does mean unified decisions to act together in practice. And I would appeal to people like Rob, let's have a bit more of that while we're having the continuing debate. But first of all, my English is not very, very good, so if uh, you don't understand me, somebody can translate of my comrades. Um, I think a uh, very interesting point what Alex says is about how we relate the movement to the trade unionist, to the trade union, and also the movement to the, um, to the organ political organization. In the Indignados movement, our key point was uh, bring the movement to the trade union and bring the trade union to the movement, relating each uh, space to make it bigger. I mean, uh, we, we understand the union and the organization as the big important points in our political activity, but also we understand that the structures can be uh, changed inside to make it more um, friendly for new people, for new workers, uh, for workers that are more young, that are not, uh, that works in places where the union tradition is not very hard, and to um, to bring them in a new in a new um, in a new place where they can uh, be politicized and when they where they can uh, bring their ideas. This has uh, a good impact in our organization and as well in our in our trade union. I think uh, the the our our activity in the Indignados movement was um, put put the. Um, the centrality on the on on workers, what w w their fights, what are they doing in their places, and we bring lots of people of the movement to the strikes uh, of workers. And this this activity is not very. Sometimes we have some problems because uh, the, at, at the very the really beginning, the trade unionists like me and other comrades were not very welcome because they identify us like bureaucracy. But when we fight together, hand by hand, they understand the power of uh, uh, trade unionism and also the power of, of being in a, um, in, organ in a political organization. And for me, in that moment where um, the movement was very, very very, very high, and there's lots of people uh, in Lucha. Uh, it, it, for me, it was the, um, the north, you know, because uh, uh, you can, you can, you know, where are you? Who is your people? Uh, the, the good theory to, to, to win workers to the revolution. And, and a central thing uh, on, on this was the newspaper and also the, the people in the inside and lucha that's working on theory. Uh, and that's it. A few things I want to come in on. Uh, the relevance of a Leninist organization uh, in the 21st century, one, a few things. One is that uh, if you look around Europe, well, we're pretty all aware, uh, like, like uh, the rise of fascism is one uh, reason why we need to push uh, a revolutionary socialist organization forward. Because in the coming years, uh, like, uh, like I'm sure there's comrades from uh, France, Greece, and Hungary, and Holland and other places uh, that, know, that are pretty much aware of the, uh, the rise of fascism. Uh, uh, we have to uh, deal with that as a, we have to deal with fascism very seriously because unfortunately, as we all know, it, fascism is not dead. Uh, 
We, uh, and even the, the, they're becoming very confident in this country. Like last year, I, I heard in Liverpool they, t- they attacked uh, a trade union hall, I think it was a unison. So uh, even in this country, they might, uh, they're, they're relatively small still, but, uh, but, they're, they're, but they're certainly getting more, if you know, slightly more articulacy with UKIP. Also, another thing uh, that I think we need to deal with like besides uh, giving workers confidence uh, to to get out and strike and uh, persuade them to join a uh, Leninist organisation in the 21st century, we also have to persuade, uh, I think there's 14 or 15 million unemployed that are, are you know, out of work. We have to uh, target the, like the unemployment queues. They have to be targeted. It's not just the workers as well. It's the unemployed as well. It's just a number of things I think we need to like tr- flesh out hopefully tonight, but uh, I think uh, broadly speaking, like uh, this, this, like like I said, there's fascism we have to deal with, but we also have to deal with the other with the other people who aren't working because like uh, they're relevant in all of this as well. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, c- comrades. I'd like to um, sort of raise two issue, uh, a couple of issues really. Uh, that have been, that are, I think, genuine questions that have been playing on my mind about what it really is to be a Leninist today. Um, uh, Alex talked about, uh, talked rightly about the components, the, the various components of Revolutionary Party. Uh, the fact that to be a Leninist today is to organise those people who are committed revolutionaries into a single organisation, but also that that is about fundamentally organising so as to have a relationship with the working class and especially its most advanced, most militant sections. We need, of course, to be an organisation to, to organise revolutionaries because, fundamentally, if we have all reached the conclusion that uh, capitalism cannot be overthrown, uh, in fact, capitalism cannot be reformed; it must be overthrown. Then it is our interest to organise together on that basis. And there is plenty. And history is littered with examples of moments where where people have, where the absence of people com- committed to that realisation has made a huge difference. The second is that actually we have to be able to relate to the most militant sections of the working class. When Lenin writes in Left-Wing Communism about the uh, necessary features of of a revolutionary party, he writes about uh, the the necessity of of a relationship with the class-conscious vanguard. And that class-conscious vanguard is uh, the the people at the most advanced edge of struggle, the people who are learning learning new ideas through struggle, changing themselves through struggle, and in struggle, in, in struggle developing the kinds of ideas that could actually build, build an alternative society. And it's essential that the, the Revolutionary Party has an adequate relationship um, to, those, uh, to, to those people. Now, I want to raise what I think are, are two genuine questions about, given that, that formulation. Uh, the first is I think it, would, it is an absolute tragedy and a serious mistake to confuse those two things, to assume that merely in virtue of being revolutionaries, though that is an important decision that we have all made, we are therefore the most class conscious, the most advanced. Actually, we need humility. We need to be capable of relating to the people who are out there struggling, out there at the cutting edge of the fight against capitalism. The second is that in a period of historically low class struggle, we need to be honest in our assessment about where that revolutionary vanguard might emerge and where it is, and acknowledge that right now we don't know where that is, and that means that we need to be alive to new engagements, new developments, alive to, to, to all sections of the working class to see where it might emerge. And that's where I bring that finally, those, those two concerns to a concern I have about the Socialist Workers' Party as we currently have it. You see, I believe the Socialist Workers' Party over the past year has failed to integrate a generation of young radicals. Um, which we have since seen in 400 people leaving the organisation over the past few months, we have failed a very serious test to integrate a generation of young radical activists committed to overthrowing the system but who felt they could not believe be in this organisation. We need to reflect very seriously about how that happened. Um, you see, Dan raises some qu- a number of questions. The first question he raises is the question, isn't it, about the vanguard and the role of the party and how does the party relate to the class and I think actually that Alex made this quite clear we talk about organizing as a Leninist party not because the party is an end in itself but because the party is a tool to intervene in the class struggle to try to move the struggles along along the path of revolution and you see there's a reason for this isn't there We've talked about the struggles, and we hear them all at Marxism, the struggles that are happening in Egypt, in Turkey, in many other parts of the world, where there are complicated and serious questions emerging 
that whether or not revolutionaries are part of those debates, there will be debates, there will be organisation, there will be people attempting to lead the struggle in different ways. And the role of a Leninist party is to group together those people who have a vision of where those things could go. Not just a vision of the end game, but something specific to say about every struggle, about how we take every struggle forward to relate to the twists and turns of every single struggle in every debate. And therefore, it's, it means that you have to think about what sort of party that is that you need to do that. You need a combat organisation. And people People are quite right to say we need maximum debate in an organisation and we need people not just in the party to debate, we need to debate with people outside the party, we need to engage with people outside the party. But comrades, we are not a debating shop. One of the innovations, one of the great innovations of Karl Marx was he broke with the ideas of idealism to actually talk about materialism. And the reason that ideas are so important to us is that we analyse the world in order to change the world. And I think, therefore, we need the most flexible debate that we can have among ourselves, but we need unity in action to test when, whether any of those ideas are right. And we do that by a mixture of learning, of listening, of being engaged in struggles, and of then being able to make sharp shifts and turns when we need to. You think about what we've done over the past... Um, few months. You think about the response that we've had to Woolwich, for example, a very su sudden, sharp upturn in racism in Britain. And we had to think very strongly, how do we respond to that? And quite rightly, we turned the party outwards to relate to a question that had emerged and a challenge that was thrown forward to us. Or you think about something like the bedroom tax. If you want to talk about how do we engage and listen and learn from different sections of the working class, actually, sections of the working class, there was groups setting themselves up in Leeds, we learned from those, and and the role of leadership is to generalise from the best experiences of the class and try to spread it elsewhere. And that is the role of leadership both inside the party and the role of the party with inside the wider class. It's a dialogue, it's a debate, but it has to come back to having an organisation that can intervene, that's confident, that's a combat organisation that both learns but also isn't afraid to lead. Um, I'd like to say a few words about the relationship between the movements and organization based on what happened in Taksim Square in Istanbul. Um, there was very good research done about what sorts of people slept in the park for two weeks, three or 4,000 people. The average age was mid-20s. 56% uh, were people in work, but most relevant, 46% were people who'd never been to any kind of political events, any kind of uh, protest ever in their lives. So, new generation out in the square. Most of this new generation don't like the idea of central organization because, you know, we're all living in post-1989. So, for example, we recruited 30 people on the square. I thought that was very good. I really didn't think we were going to recruit that many because, as I say, most people there didn't like the idea of, the, of organization. Now, that was almost always the first discussion we had with people who came to our stalls. Now, there is a problem with that. The problem is this. When the Prime Minister said, OK, I'll meet people from the park, a delegation of 17 people went to see the Prime Minister. They were 90% men. This was not the case in the park. All of them were over the age of 40 or 50. This was not the case in the park. All of them were either... Um, leading members of chambers, architects' chambers, engineers' chambers, city planners' chambers, these are leftish organizations in Turkey, or leading members of trade unions. None of the members of these things were sleeping in the park for two weeks. So when time came to represent the movement in the park and put its demands forwards, because there was no organization in the park, because people didn't like organization. Leadership went to someone else. Secondly, afterwards, only last week, um, the, those sections of the Turkish left, which are hugely nationalist, uh, jingoistic, and wave the Turkish flag, 
who were a very small minority in the park, organized a big music festival somewhere else in Istanbul. And to the rest of the country, it looked like these were the people in the park because the people in the park were not organized enough to organize their alternative music festival or whatever. Now, this is a problem, I think, which we face very seriously. My impression is, I'm a bit too young, I missed it, but in 68, if we'd had 4,000 people sleeping in the park, we'd have recruited 300 or 3,000. Every organization in this country in 68 grew, even very small ones. Today, that's not automatic. It's the first argument we need to have with people in the movement, because unless organization emerges from it, it disappears. Right, right, comments. Uh, Ronnie Margulis' contribution from Taksim in Turkey reinforces the first point that I wanted to make, which is that, and Alex made it right at the beginning, which is that the debate we're having here is one part of a wider international debate. It's occurring in Ireland, uh, where, where I am now, but it's occurring across the world. It's a, it, there is, as Ronnie said, a hostility to Leninism or organisation or even to parties as a whole all across the new uh, movements that, uh, that are coming, for very understandable reasons. But that, that's that. And there's a, also a left reformist current internationally. Now, what I want to say here is that when there are strong currents blowing across the society and in the movements, they are always reflected inside the party. Right? It is comp because we are part of the class and part of the movement. It is imagined, you know, it's not the case that we're immune from these things. And therefore, it follows from this that it is quite wrong, in my opinion, to imagine that the current debate is all about how a disputes committee was handled, whether it was handled well or not, or about the political or personal failings of the central committee. These may exist, of course, etc. Uh, and so on, but that's not what this is about. It is about a wider argument being reflected uh, within, within, the, within the party. That's the, uh, the, the first thing that I want to say. And if the way to deal with this was just to open up to new thinking, then, of course, what we should do is jettison Leninism. But I worry, in a lot of the contributions I've heard, a lot of contributions I have heard over this weekend say, we need new thinking. Well, everybody's in favour of that. We need to be open and open to new ideas. Well, that's obviously a good thing to be. We need a renewal. Well, that's obviously good, without saying what new ideas... <laughs> Trotsky, uh, when he was involved in a fairly desperate faction fight, once said that, uh, you imagine you're a, a, a surgeon performing an operation, and the surgeon starts to say, the implements I've got are not good enough. They're really faults with them. I want to debate and discuss how good the implements are. He said, what would you think of this person? If they didn't have any better ones who said, oh, well, I'm going to discard. What would the patient say? I'm going to discard this scalpel because I want a much more beautiful scalpel. Only there isn't a more beautiful scalpel. It's a th point to think about in this situation. I want to go back just to the question also That's of... Len minutes, John, Sorry? So you need to, it's three minutes, John. It's three minutes. OK. I will, I will just... I'll wait one last sentence on, on this. It goes back to the question of Lenin and Luxembourg and so on, and that is this. Right? It's not just about what you say... It's about what you do. It's not just about whether you're for a party in principle or for democratic centralism when you're standing on the platform. It's do you actually build it? That is also a question that we have to consider. There you have it the second time. What was John's talking about is there's a split in the party. Those who want to talk and do nothing and those who didn't want to talk and do everything. That is rubbish, right? That is an absolute... If that's how, if that's how it's been polarised, 
If that's been in John's head, then that's a scandal, and it's glam glad I'm hearing it from this platform. Because anybody who argues about how... You see, I'm no for permanent factions, right? But I'll tell you what, I've been arguing for four years for an idea of a different kind of wider leadership that's required in this party if we are going to build a kind of developing intellectual, worker intellectual, as well as intellectual leadership. And Esme, we are a bloody debating society. I'll tell you where we debate. We debate every week in our branch. We didn't take, there's no a letter from, an, from the Central Committee for, for Alex Kalinikos in my branch every week that tells me what to think. If something happens in Edinburgh, then people in my branch, on different sides, respond to it. Tell me in Edinburgh where anybody in the opposition has failed to respond to anything that's been going on. You will not find that. So therefore we'll wipe that out of the way, right? The argument that's been put and conducted is about what can a Leninist party? See, Julie, I know that, that Alex is in a direct, you know, he looks up to the sky and looks down and he, you know, he kens exactly what Tony Cliff is, is thinking, <laughs> right? But I'll tell you, there's another comrade who I heard an argument, right? Julie Watterson, this is what Julie said in a meeting when we were in the IS tendency in a fight and an argument about Seattle and whatever. And people were arguing the toss. And people were then quoting Lenin, here, there, and everywhere, three all different sides. And she said it in the only way that she can say it. She said, listen, Lenin's fucking dead. We're the Leninists. <laughs> right? The argument is that the party of knee rank and file, of people who want to argue. So we want to make sure that what we're talking about is a party where the most class-conscious workers worker intellectuals and intellectuals engage and focus on the outside world while having a thorough argument. See, John, there is new ideas, and they will come forward, but it's no bloody easy to just... Right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I'm... Ah, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Dan Swain asked about what it meant in terms of having a relate, were we the class conscious workers in um, the Revolutionary Party? And of course, at different levels of class struggle, how our tactics are carried out will be different. And I think that in terms of our situation here in Britain, we have to, and I think this is the perspective for that, the Socialist Workers Party, we have to build and group around us the people who don't want to just wait for the election, whether those are the people in the Labour Party of the trade union leaders, and whether it's the left-wing version of that in the People's Assembly. We want to group together the, those people who want to fight in the here and now. If we're in Egypt, we have a different way of doing that. We have tens of millions of people out on the street of people who aren't waiting for the next election and they, they d bring down and overthrow their government and they have different uh, problems. And I think in terms of the SWP, we've obviously been through a very troubled period and if we don't say collectively that we have to learn some lessons from that, then we would be very stupid. But I think... I think I've learned in practice something that we've argued for a long time. We've argued against permanent factions. And people say, but surely you want permanent democracy. How can you not want that? But actually, and of course, we want debate and discussion every week. But the problem with permanent factions is it means that we are saying one side is all right and the other side is all wrong. And that doesn't mean that we learn any lessons. It doesn't mean that we learn from the debate. And these are difficult tactical questions that we have to make every day. And so we have to have 
proper, serious discussion where we do debate out with each other, we do listen to each other, and that we learn, even when we disagree, we learn from what other people are saying. And if we don't do that, we will not be able to lead the struggles that we want to be able to. And that's what I think we have to do now. Um, very basically, I mean, I, let's, let's spell a basic out. Revolution isn't a parlour game. Right? It affects people's lives. It makes a difference to people's lives. Sometimes, when you put yourself out there, you end up in a situation, like some of us, not just myself but others, where you end up being victimised. And being victimised means that you're attacked as an individual because you carry out, you carry out the decisions of the organisation you're in. You see, Cliff used to talk about how we were revolutionaries first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and then we were trade unionists. And the reason for that is simple, because what Lenin talked about is how a revolutionary organisation was both with the class, but in advance of the class on certain elements. I'll give you an example. We had a construction strike of electricians. I went along to a meeting in Hartlepool as a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, not to accommodate, as people would do, to the ideas in there, but to try to win people to revolutionary ideas. And when an electrician got up and made a racist comment, a vile racist comment, I had two choices. I could have taken the position of the sect and said, these are a bunch of racists, I'm walking out. I could have taken the position of those people who said... I'll keep quiet, I'll say nothing, I'll accommodate. But I didn't because I'm a revolutionary, because I'm a Leninist, because I know that it is absolutely important to win not all the workers in there, but at least some of them by standing up for principles, even if it means getting up and disagreeing and arguing with people who disagree with you with inside that meeting. But because I did that and I challenged the racism, it meant that after I'd had to leave the meeting and the guy made another racist comment, what happened is some of the other younger electricians in there jumped in and said, you've been told once, we don't want that in our meetings. That was about standing on a position of cl clarity, but not accommodating. You see, I've listened to some of this debate about people saying, well, you know, the party should be more open and so on, the CC. If anybody thinks that the Central Committee of the Socialist Workers' Party, as it presently constituted, is going to be the general staff of the British Revolution, then they're living in cloud cuckoo land. But if anybody thinks that we're going to get to a British Revolution, if we simply decide to ignore the democratic decisions of the biggest revolutionary organisation in Britain, then they're also living in cloud cuckoo land. When I was a branch secretary of a union, we took a clear position. Even if we won a vote as we once did for strike action by one, every single steward in that meeting was expected to carry out that decision. And they did. And if I expect that from people in a union branch, how much more is it expected of people who regard themselves as revolutionaries? Right, comrades, um, I actually found myself agreeing with about 95% of what Alex Kalinikos said. Now, I think there's two reasons for that. One reason is that actually I've been in the same organisation as him for the last 40 years, and we've both made our contributions, such as they were, towards building this organisation, and I'm very happy with a great deal of what we have done over that period. The other reason, I think, is that Alex actually kept things on such a level of generalisation and abstraction that it was quite hard to uh, put your fingers on exactly what to disagree with. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something Alex wrote in the Socialist Review um, uh, last month in reply to me. And he said, we want a leadership that has confidence and authority. Now, I don't think a single person in this room is going to disagree with that. Nobody's going to say we want an unconfident uh, uh, leadership that can't uh, exert any, uh, any pull on the membership. But you see, I'd just like to ask one or two questions. What is a confident leadership? I would say two things, among others, indicate to me a confident leadership. One is a leadership that wants to have an argument, that wants to listen to the other side, that wants to have the argument in full, not a leadership that says, we have 25 minutes, you have six.
And secondly, a confident leadership is a leadership that can change its mind. A confident leadership isn't scared to say, all right, we got that one wrong. Authority in a leadership, you know, you look at Lenin. Lenin, Lenin could go to the Bolsheviks and, for example, completely change uh, the line of the organisation with the April Theses because people knew what Lenin had done. Now, I'm not sure that our leadership can always make that same claim. Now, you know, we're not going to resolve these issues tonight. But there have been very serious problems. Alex himself uses the word bruising for the last few months. We've had a lot of losses. We've had uh, serious setbacks in the last six months. Now, you know, I'm quite prepared to wait for the uh, pre-conference discussion, although in reality, as somebody mentioned the other day, the pre-conference discussion, whether you like it or not, has started now. Uh, but, you know, I believe Alex started off by saying the CC are accountable. I want to wait and see, by the next conference, what proposals the That's CC are bringing to actually renew and restructure the leadership of the party so that we don't make the same damaging mistakes we've made over the last year. I want to go back, really, to Alex's point about the pressures from left reformism and movementism. Because I think what that does, in terms of the pressures on us, is in terms of the kind of frustration people feel about the degree and the pace to which the class struggle develops, the problem is that that becomes internalised and what then becomes the problem is not how we relate to the outside world, it becomes the perfection of the SWP. And I'm sorry, comrades, that's not the starting point. We can talk about issues and so on and so forth, but they have to be real issues in the sense that what we're debating is how we intervene around a whole, special, a whole number of things. I want to see a debate in the party about whether we get the bedroom tax right, uh, protest right, whether we get the question of fighting the fascists and UKIP right. These are the issues that are absolutely central and these are the ones that are going to count in terms of the effectiveness of the party. The question, therefore, is not as I think a number of Rob Owen onwards speak, very internalised comments about the nature of the party. The whole question, really, of what Lenin got up to and the way in which he developed the party was never a question of abstract questions of organisation. They were always absolutely intimately related to the tasks that were set in terms of how do you develop an organisation capable of intervention, intervention within the militant minority but a broader, min a broader layer of people because you wanted to win not just the militants in terms of their militancies but the militants in terms of their ability to understand and advance the cause of revolution. That I think is what faces us and therefore what I want to see us concentrating on is how are we going to have those debates about what we're doing, how are we going to strengthen the party and it's no good talking about loss of members unless we're prepared to do something about those very issues that count in terms of whether we are more effective next year than we are now. I'm very pleased that Marxism has not been the kind of uh, disaster that some were predicting. Some people clearly wanted it to be a disaster. It is not. We're having very real debates about very real issues, and that's exactly where we should start from, not from the internalised shortcut of the perfection of the party. OK. I, I agree with Ian Birchall uh, about one thing, which is I'm not Lenin. Um, it's true we've been through a very profound and painful crisis. Uh, over the handling of serious, serious complaints. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm part of a determined effort to address those complaints and to learn the lessons from this whole process. And of course, of course, learning the lessons means looking at and recognising the mistakes that have been, that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that have been made. That's, that's part of any honest process um, 
in a, in a, in a revolutionary party. But I think it's the purest opportunism when Rob Owen turns that, that crisis and its very specific driving force into a general condemnation of the party. You see, is the picture one of general pay, failure over the past few months? Actually, I don't think so. I think what we've actually seen is, a, is rather a successful process of reorientation um, of the party moving on from the fact that the strike movement that took place in 2011 has been stalled by the trade union bureaucracy and redirecting ourselves to relate to and actually to build the, the new movements that are developing around austerity. So when it comes to the bedroom tax, the SWP has been centrally involved in the development of that movement. Remember, at this platform, the woman from Glasgow who started Marxism off talking about her experiences of the struggle against the bedroom tax. Remember the People's Assembly. The People's Assembly that was supposed to be something that it would be very difficult for the SWP to, 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 to relate to, that we would find ourselves in great difficulty in. In fact, our comrades went into the People's Assembly and found themselves arguing very effectively with fellow activists who wanted to hear what they had to say. Think, think of the wave of reaction, which hasn't stopped after the Woolwich killing, and the way in which Unite Against Fascism, which shamefully has become um, a, a matter of a, a factional football within the party in recent, in recent months, the way in which Unite Against Fascism stepped forward to halt, halt, the, halt the fascists. I think Rob began to articulate what it is his real project when he talked about opening up to the rest of the far left, which is a project of what's called revolutionary regroupment. In other words, the existing far left organizations getting together to fuse into a larger one. We have avoided those projects because in general, those involved are more interested in talking to each other than relating to real movements outside in the class. That, does, that doesn't mean that we're not interested in real projects. I hope, I would be delighted if left unity led to the development of a new left reformist party in Britain. That would break the existing constellation of political forces in Britain. And we, we would very much welcome that and want to, want to be par, part of it. But let's distinguish the micro-politics of the sect from re, real real movements. Dan says we should look for the, 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 the new vanguards that are going to emerge. That's fine. Of course, I agree with that. But there's a nonsense argument that comes, which involves really dissing the existing vanguard. And this is the critique of public sector workers. The argument that the problem with the SWP is that there are too many teachers in it. Now, this is, where does this come from? It comes from people like Zizek, who have argued that the anti-austerity movement is a movement of the salaried bourgeoisie trying to defend their privileges. When you analyse that, that argument comes down to saying public sector workers are still relatively well organised and therefore have to be been able to develop, defend themselves more effectively than other group, groups of workers. That's a strength in the situation. Most of our time in the SWP, we have been marginal in terms of our influence in the most combative groups of workers. That was true in the 1970s. The Communist Party was much more influential among the dockers and the car workers and so on and so forth. It was true even during the miners' strike in the mid-1980s. Now we have hundreds, thousands of SWP activists well-rooted in unions like the teachers and the civil servants that have been the focus of the fight against austerity, and this is somehow a bad thing and makes us a conservative force. This is nonsense. This is complete, complete nonsense. That doesn't mean that we don't have to be open to new forces, new developments. What the comrades in Enlucha did around the 15th of May movement is very interesting, and we should try and learn from that, that we shouldn't be prepared to experiment and, and so on. But don't deny and seek to undermine our existing strengths in the name of something that doesn't exist as an, an alternative at the, at the present time. The loss of all those students is a massive collective failure. 
I accept my share of the responsibility of that. But for me, the crucial failure came in the way in which we didn't properly integrate the students we won out of the movement, the movement of 20, 2010. What happened was that I think that a lot of the students who joined weren't argued with sufficiently, weren't sufficiently integrated into, into our ideas, were flattered, uh, were told that they were wonderful, were encouraged to accept uh, versions. I'm sorry, I've heard these arguments, so please don't try and pretend that they weren't made, that students were the new vanguard who would catalyse movements by workers, that the workers would follow the students. Now, I'm old... And I was part of a generation of revolutionary students who helped to shape capitalism from one end to the other in the uh, 1960s and 1970s. What, did that mean that when I joined the International Socialists, I was lionized and told I was wonderful? No, I was told I was the lowest form of creation. <laughs> I, was, um, I, I was systematically argued with. I was, the first leaflet I wrote, I remember it being torn to pieces because... Uh, not literally, but I was torn to pieces because of all the long words I used. Although, Ian, please, please, it's embarrassing for intellectuals to attack abstraction. You should be ashamed of yourself. Um, the, um, I, I was forced to learn as part of a collective of revolutionaries, many of which were workers. We failed to do that with the students we won after 2010. That's a lesson that we need to learn. Now, the final point... I want to make is to Willie Lee. Because, of course, Willie's like... Right. Sorry, not Willie Lee. Sorry, this is a... Like I said, I'm old. There are many kinks in my brain. Um, Willie Black. And, of course, Willie's right that an effective revolutionary organisation depends upon the creative intervention of its, of its members. Cliff, one of Cliff's quotes was that there's no rank and file in a revolutionary party. I can't remember who he claimed had actually said it. I think, first, you know, whether it was Lenin or Trotsky, personally I think he invented it himself. Um, but, uh, of course, it's right. We're building a party of leaders where everyone leads outside in the movements in the class, in their neighbourhoods, in the workplace, and so on and so forth. Of course, that's true. And without those, those, those leaders in the, in the class, we would be a much weaker and more effect, ineffective organisation. We would be like one of the sects that Rob wants us to increasingly appro approximate. And to be a party of leaders, you have to have constant argument and debate. But there is a question I want to ask... Willie, which is what, happened when, what happens when you lose the vote. Yeah. Willie says he's against permanent factions, but he's been arguing for four years for restructuring of the leadership, whatever. Fair enough, fair dues, you know, it's perfectly legitimate argument to have about restructuring our internal democracy and so on, so on and so forth. You're absolutely entitled every year to raise that question during the pre-conference period if you like, Willie, what you're not entitled to do, I believe, is to insist on pursuing that argument all the time if you fail to win, convince the rest of us. And I... And I, I want to make a real appeal to the comrades in the, in the faction. We all know it's a faction. It operates as a faction. No, no, I want to make... I want to appeal to the comrades in the faction. Honestly. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just let Alex finish? I think it's a bit inconsistent to say that you wanted Marxism to be a real arena of debate and then to try and shout people down. So I want to appeal. This is quite sincere, comrade, so please listen. I'm I agree with the comrades who said a revolutionary leadership should be prepared to listen to comrades and to learn not just from people inside the party but from outside the party. I think that goes for all of us. So I want to ask, um, ask the comrades, oppose this, this challenge to the comrades. Say you fail. Say you don't carry the majority. 
So you don't win the organisation to the specific proposals that, you, that you're putting forward. You're absolutely entitled to support proposals and to want to damn the leadership. Say so you fail. Say so you don't overturn the leadership. What are you going to do? Are you going to carry on insisting to organise week in, week out, month in, month out, the way that you have for much of the la last year? Because if you do, that is the logic of destruction. I, I mean, I don't mean... I mean, I mean, that is the logic of destruction for all of us, for us as an organisation. And I think that would be a disaster. So I think the stakes are very high because I think you will fail. I don't think that you will be able to carry the organisation. You could kick me out, but you wouldn't persuade the bulk of the comrades in the party that, that you were right. So I think you will fail. So what are you going to do when you fail? I appeal to you all to carry on working as good revolutionaries as part of a united revol revolutionary organization because the truth is we haven't smashed capitalism but we have achieved wonders in the past few decades. Uh, Willie quoted Julie Waterson, a very good friend of my mind, mine, not really at her best really. I don't think that was Julie's greatest, greatest moment to recognize that Lenin was dead. Um, <laughs> But Julie, Julie led us against the Nazis. And Julie led us against... Julie led us against the armoured rat police in Prague. She represents... She was just one particularly wonderful example of what we can achieve as an organisation in, in herself... She represented a, the kind of collective achievement that we can make. Now, I think there are lots of Julie Watersons in our future and lots of the kind of triumphs that we've been able to achieve. Please, comrades, don't jeopardise that. 